Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we are going to talk about how to uncover the power of inclusive language today. Uh, my name is Jamie. I'm the product marketing manager at the events calendar. Um, and I'm basically just going to hand it over to Team Yoast uh, to do their thing. So go for it. Thank you, Jamie, for your warm words. So my dear people in the audience, before we dive into the matter, I would we would really love to get to know you a little bit better. So why don't you let us know in the chat where you're joining us from, what you do during office hours, and um, how you're involved in publishing content. As in, are you writing content? Are you editing content? And if any of these, are you involved in creating educational content or conversion-focused content? And if you're not writing, are you then maybe wrangling your workflows or involved in any other sort of way? We would love to know and get to know you a little better. And if you feel like it, we would also love to hear if you've actually given the Yoast Inclusive Language Analysis a try. So let's see if anyone is up for introducing themselves. And there's always a little delay on the line. So we'll give this a minute. Hey, Doreen, thanks for joining. Content for the website, newsletter, social media. Um, hey, Susan, thanks for joining. Communication management creates content. Cool. Hey there, Steve. Managing your website. Awesome. Hey, Michelle, so cool that you're joining us and thanks for the shout out. Sweet. So I'll say hi to another few of you in a minute, but this is us. My coworker, Anjeska Shua, works as a linguist for Team Yoast. And when she started out at Team Yoast, which is way before I did, she first focused on research. But along the way, she also worked really hard to write code. And she's been one of the driving forces behind our inclusive language analysis. And also, like me, she adores cats. Then, as for me, I am currently leading the community team at Yoast. And in the last years before I joined Team Yoast, I mainly worked as a content specialist. I was already passionate about accessible content. And I also got to work with one of the world's leading uh, accessibility specialists. I learned tons from her. So from accessible content to inclusive content was not a huge gap. And I fell in love really quickly with that as well. So let's say it didn't take much convincing to get me to join the campaign team who got in charge of spreading the word about this and teach her out. Because in my personal opinion, communicating on the web is all about getting people to know, like, and trust you. Someone's first visit to your website is oftentimes compared to a first date, and that's for a reason. Because during a first date like that, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. And those things might prove you're not as likable or as trustworthy to your date as you'd hope for. Being rude to a waiter, for instance, or making derogatory comments about someone in a restaurant or during a story you're sharing. The same goes for your website. Some ways of expressing yourself can be a turn off to groups of marginalized people or to people who are close to marginalized people. 
They might leave your site to never come back. And they might even share that bad experience with their peers. It doesn't matter if you're selling physical items in a web shop, if you're trying to get leads off your website for the services you're selling, or if you're merely selling your point of view. People prefer to do business with people they know, like, and trust. Just like most people prefer to be in a relationship with people they know, like, and trust. So choosing inclusive language will help you build that know, like, and trust. And we gladly help you make that a new wholesome habit. So before I hand over my microphone to Agnieszka, let me say hi to Mona, thanks for joining, and to Beth, yes, the session is going to be recorded, and to Shelly, thank you so much for joining. So by the end of this presentation, you'll go home with three things. You'll understand what inclusive language is and how every website owner benefits from using it. You'll be aware of some of the most common misconceptions around inclusive language, and you'll know how to get started to make this a new and wholesome habit. How does that sound? Cool? Then let me hand over my microphone to my coworker Agnieszka so that she can, she can explain a bit more about inclusive language from a linguistic perspective. Thank you. So what is inclusive language? Inclusive language is about choosing alternatives for expressions that stigmatize, stereotype, erase, or otherwise exclude people who belong to marginalized groups. And that is any group that faces systemic discrimination and as a result holds less power in their society. Some of the most common bases for such discrimination are race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, disability, age, appearance, and socioeconomic status. The stigma, stereotypes, and erasure towards these groups are encoded in many different areas of our everyday lives, including in language. Inclusive language is about choosing terms that don't reinforce these harmful ideas. Using non-inclusive words or expressions has a real impact on real people. Words can absolutely harm people. They can make you feel dehumanized or invisible or all sorts of other bad things, even if that's not the intention of the speaker. But words also have the power to make us feel respected, seen and valued and other positive things. So if we can build a habit of choosing inclusive wording over non-inclusive one, this will have a positive impact that may lead to a more inclusive society. In addition, language has the power to shape our worldview. If you hear something often enough, you're much more likely to internalize it. For example, if we keep hearing the phrase confined to a wheelchair to describe people who use wheelchairs, it can be hard not to internalize the idea that using a wheelchair is some kind of a tragedy since the word confined has negative connotations of being trapped in a negative situation. Or the idea that wheelchair users can never leave their wheelchairs. Well, in fact, many of them only need a wheelchair in specific situations. On the other hand, if we hear the phrase using a wheelchair or wheelchair users, it's easy for us to see a wheelchair as a neutral or even a positive thing to see it as a useful tool that allows many people to navigate the world with more ease and independence. Okay, so now that we've defined inclusive and non-inclusive language, let's look at some examples. So I'm going to show you some made up examples of non-inclusive phrases in event descriptions, and I'll try to explain to you why they are non-inclusive. So let's start with this one, which says, sign up for this music event featuring, lo featuring local gypsy artists. Um, do any of you maybe already know what is the non-inclusive term here and why it's non-inclusive? 
So let's wait for a moment and see if people have thoughts about that. Don't leave us hanging, people. Gypsy. Oh, three at the same time. Awesome. I love you. Yeah, that's that's right. So actually, uh, it is considered a racial slur by many Romani people, which, of course, makes it non-inclusive. Uh, it's a term that was invented by Europeans, not by Romani people. In fact, it comes from the word Egyptian because Europeans wrongly assume that Roma people originated from Egypt. And also because of Europeans' long history of racism against Romani people, the world has become laden with, with negative connotations and stereotypes. That's why the advice is to use the word Romani or Roma instead, which is a neutral term and it's how most Romani people want to be called. Uh, there is one exception, though, if you are talking about someone who wants to be referred to with this word, then it's obviously okay to use it. Some Romani people have actually reclaimed the term, and they want people to use it to refer to them. And you should respect how people want to be called, of course. Okay, let's move on to the next example. Uh, so let's have a look at the sentence, which says both women and men are welcome to attend this childbirth course. Does anyone have an idea what might make this sentence potentially non-inclusive? And maybe how you could reward it? Yes, Liz says it excludes non-binary people. And Marianne says both parents might be a better option. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, um, that's exactly it. So the phrase women and men or men and women can be exclusionary uh, towards people of other genders. So for example, Imagine you're a pregnant non-binary person. You may not feel particularly welcome to join these childbirth classes when you read this description. Even if you understand that the person who wrote this probably doesn't mean that you actually shouldn't join the course, you may still be hesitant to join it. This phrasing just doesn't signal an inclusive and welcoming environment towards people of all genders. Uh, so, yeah, something like people of all genders or both parents, maybe, yeah, uh, the pregnant person and their partner, uh, something like that. And those are all more inclusive alternatives. Uh, there's one more example I want to show you. So here the event description says, if you're a bit OCD about keeping things organized, you might enjoy a career as a professional organizer. So what word or words would you replace to make this sentence more inclusive? Let's see. And thank you for playing with us, my dear people. I see an answer saying OCD. Mm -hmm. And Liz says elimin eliminate OCD. Shelley said OCD and potentially replace that with if you struggle with organization. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, so OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder is a medical condition. And if you're referring to the medical condition, that's the correct term to use. 
uh, but I don't think that's the case in this sentence. Um, and using this term as a sort of metaphor to describe personality traits or habits, like being extremely organized, actually trivializes the medical condition and the experience of people living with it. And this contributes to mental health conditions not being taken seriously. Um, and it also perpetuates this stereotype about OCD, such as that it's mostly just about being obsessed with tidiness, which is huge oversimplification and it's just inaccurate. Um, yeah, so here we suggest alternatives like pedantic, obsessed, perfectionist, um, maybe even something more positive in this context would work, like passionate. Absolutely. Also, Shelley corrected. She said she should have said if you enjoy organization, and I missed that too. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. So, if you didn't know much about inclusive language before this webinar, it has hopefully become a bit more clear now. But just to be sure that we're all on the same page, let me address some common misconceptions about inclusive language. During our research, we discovered that there are quite a few myths about inclusive language. So let's get, let's get the most common ones out of the way. Misconception number one is something that we already touched upon, and it's that inclusive or non-inclusive language uh, doesn't have any real life effects. While we did address it earlier, it's an important point, so it's worth repeating. Um, yeah, language has the power to normalize ideas. So if we use non-inclusive language, we normalize non-inclusive ideas. If we use inclusive language, we normalize inclusive ideas. And language also has the power to hurt people. It can basically function as microaggressions. But it also has the power to have the opposite effect, to make people feel valued, seen, and respected. And don't we all want that? Another misconception is that inclusive language is a new invention. So the topic of inclusive language has been quite popular lately. So this might make it seem like it's a new invention. But language has always been connected to social and cultural norms. It reflects them, and it can also play a role in spreading them. When norms change, so does language. And when people try to challenge harmful ideas, they often also challenge the use of language that reflects and normalizes them. For example, feminist activists of the 1960s and 70s were challenging the use of words like he and man to refer to humans in general. And this was part of their fight to increase the visibility and status of women. Another misconception is that the advice on inclusive language never changes. So it would be nice if we just had to memorize a finite list of non-inclusive terms and their inclusive alternatives, and then we're done once and for all. We are set to be using inclusive language for the rest of our lives. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, as our understanding of ourselves and the world around us evolves, and as the world itself keeps changing, so does our collective understanding of what language is and isn't inclusive. For example, you may have heard the advice to use terms like people with disabilities instead of disabled people. The argument is that phrases like disabled people reduce people to their disabilities while phrases like people with disabilities help to separate the person and their disability. This advice gets some things right, such as advising to use the word disability over outdated words like handicap or special needs, but it doesn't get everything right. In fact, it reflects non-disabled people not fully understanding the experiences and the desires of disabled people. Many disabled people have objected to this advice, saying that they actually like to be called disabled because being disabled is a part of who they are. 
they don't want you to desperately try to separate them from their disability because it is a part of their identity. And using an adjective to describe a part of your identity doesn't mean you're reduced to that identity. After all, no one seems to have a problem with phrases like a black woman or a gay person. We don't think it reduces someone to their blackness or to them being gay. So why would it be the case with the word disabled? For example, the disability activist and writer Emily Ladau said this, disability is a state of being, a fact of life. It's not a dirty word. Furthermore, for so many people, disabled is so much more than a descriptor. It is an identity and culture unto itself. It is a source of pride. So I am disabled. I am disabled just as much as I am a brown haired, brown eyed, glasses wearing female. It is part of me. It is part of who I am. So this is an example of our understanding of inclusive language evolving. The more we listen and try to understand people's experiences and the more that they understand their experiences and identities. And another myth that I want to address is that inclusive language does not offend anyone and it makes everyone happy. So making everyone happy is impossible. Inclusive language is about avoiding language that harms certain groups of people, for example, through stereotyping or erasing them. But the thing is that some people might be unhappy when they see examples of inclusive language. For example, if someone believes that only men can be good firefighters, they may be unhappy to see people say firefighters instead of firemen. Maybe it makes them afraid that this wording will encourage more people of other genders to become firefighters. Or let's say someone strongly believes in equality, but they just don't understand the point of inclusive language. They think it's unnecessary and so they might feel annoyed when they see it becoming more popular. It might make them feel pressured to use it, even though they personally believe it's a waste of time and effort. So these people are not happy, but of course they are not harmed by the use of inclusive language. And that's what inclusive language is about. It's, a, it's about avoiding potentially harmful language. Okay, so the last misconception I want to address is that you should feel, you should feel bad for using non-inclusive language. I get it. It's not a nice feeling to realize that the language you've been using might be harmful to other people. But we have all done it. And even the most dedicated people still make mistakes and are learning. And as I mentioned, our understanding of what is and isn't inclusive evolves. So naturally, we will be making mistakes along the way. It does not make you a bad person if you have unintentionally use language that's not inclusive, as long as you're trying to learn and improve. So be kind to yourself and to other people who may not know about inclusive language as much as you do. So now that, now that we have addressed the most common misconceptions, Yvette will tell us why everyone wins if they choose to use inclusive language. Thank you, Agnieszka. And I am seeing some of the comments. I'm going to suggest that we get into some of those by the end of the presentation. So let's talk about that. You see, there are three main benefits to using inclusive language. On the highest level, it helps build a more inclusive world related to your website, it helps improve user experience. And then when customer behavior on your site shows that more people stick around and click around, that might very well lead to higher rankings in those search results. Moreover, it might help curb a drop of rankings. But more on that later. Let me elaborate first on the first one. So as we already explained, people are likely to internalize whatever they hear often, 
whether that's something that improves or break down they have the, the image they have of the world or of themselves. In other words, the word you use have the power to either make life for the people around you easier and more fun or harder and more frustrating. And the interesting thing is that if you're intentional about the first one, the smiles and the increased confidence around you will likely reflect right back onto you. Have you ever noticed that? Try to give people around you a compliment. Watch them light up. Take in their smiles. A little friendliness goes such a long way. Now, the same goes for your website. Now, of course, the content on your site should cater to the needs of your target audience. So while it should have a friendly vibe for everyone, of course, it shouldn't try to help everyone accomplish all of their goals because that wouldn't be a smart business decision, right? Clear, friendly, inclusive messaging, however, is more likely to appeal to, appeal to everyone within your target audience. That way, they are more likely to what I call stick around and click around, but also take that desired action that you aim for them, like signing up for your newsletter or making the first purchase, a repeat purchase, or writing a review. And did you know that search engines like Google track how people behave when they click on the link in the search result that leads to your website? If many people return to the search results a matter of seconds, the search engines see that as a sign that your website doesn't help them accomplish their goals. Feeling turned off by the use of marginalizing or stigmatizing language could be a reason for them to leave your site right away. And if relatively many visitors leave your site quickly, this might damage your rankings in the search results. Moreover, Team Google has become more and more vocal about how they care about diversity and inclusion. Search advocate John Mueller, for instance, recently tweeted, if you write anything for SEO, please watch out for inclusive language. It doesn't take much work and you might not get it right all the time, but taking steps to get better really matters. Also, Google recently updated their instructions for quality raters. Those are the people who look at a website when something within the system alerted. And by itself, those quality rater updates are not something special. They do that regularly. But what's new recently is that they now specifically instruct quality raters to watch out for content that promotes intolerance for the view beliefs or behaviors of groups and for content that contains dehumanizing stereotypes. So not being intentional about inclusive language might actually harm your rankings even further. So now that you'll know how to benefit from writing more inclusively after we explained what it is and what the common misconceptions are, how do you actually get started? Well, like with any new habit, it takes time and it takes practice. And the new Yoast Inclusive Language Analysis will help you with both being aware of what terms are or may be perceived as non-inclusive and will suggest you alternatives and refers, refers you to resources to learn more. We're also really, really excited that since a few weeks, it's actually available in both the premium, but also now in the free version of Yoast. That means you don't need to invest money when you're not able to. You can still make use of this. So how about we take the tool for a spin and then after that, I'm just going to share a few more general tips. doing a quick look at the notes. Okay. Um, yes, so let's get into those also later. I will need to change screens for a second, so bear with me.
taking a quick look to check with Jamie. Can you see it? Perfect. Thank you. So we have created a very basic demo site for this. And first of all, it's good to know that this analysis is not activated by default. To activate it, go to the Yoast settings, click on features, and then flip the switch right here. You can turn it off. It's turned off automatically. And you can turn it on. And don't forget to save changes. Believe me, I have done that. So after your settings have been saved, let's have a look at the draft post. And you'll find that right here. So let me tell you, um, this is also one of the descriptions of this webinar. And Agneska and I had a lot of fun messing it up a little bit. Um, as you see, the inclusive language analysis is currently showing a, tra a red traffic light. Obviously, it needs work. Now, if you click in the top of the screen, right on the Yoast icon, and then scroll down a little bit and click right here on the inclusive language, you will see both red traffic lights and orange traffic lights. The red ones indicate terms that are non-inclusive under all circumstances, and the orange one indicate terms that are potentially non-inclusive. Now, if you're a little bit like me and you see refer to crazy, you'll scroll up and down and you simply can't find it. Um, they made it easier for people like us. Look at this red, this eye icon, see what happens. It highlights the term right away so that you can see where the suggestion is. And the explanation in this case is avoid using crazy as it is potentially harmful. Consider using an alternative such as wild, baffling, startling, chaotic, shocking, etc. Also note the link here. And now within this system, I would have to go out of this one and then into another screen share. So I won't do that right now, right away. But if you click on this link, it will open a page on our Yoast help pages, and you will find more in-depth information about this particular topic. And also you'll find links to external resources um, because one of the things that we really believe in at Team Yoast is that it takes consulting a variety of resources from authoritative sources to form your actual opinion. So how about we try replacing crazy? And we'll go with the suggestion and we will use shocking. And the suggestion is all gone. If we look at the next one, be careful when using he or she, as this is potentially exclusionary. Let's see where we can find that. See, right here. They suggest using they instead. And another suggestion is gone. Now, there may be cases when you don't agree. Feel free to leave them open. If we look at the OCD one right here, and the explanation says, avoid using OCD unless you talk about a specific medic condition. Try using pedantic or obsessed. So how about we make turn this one into obsessed? Then one more. Spirit animal, be careful when using spirit animal. It's potentially harmful. Try an alternative like a hero or an icon. We'll turn this into hero. And then the last one, tribe. Let me see where we've been hiding that one. Oh, there. 
Be careful when using tribe. Consider using an alternative, such as group, cohort, or crew. How about we make this group? And would you look at that? One green traffic light. So, I really hope that this gave you a little bit of a, an idea of how the tool could help you. I am going to close the screen and go back to our presentation and then hand over back to Agnieszka. So just one sec and I will be right there. Yes, so I'm going to share some general tips that can help you in addition to using the feature to start using more inclusive language. So the first tip is to ask and listen. Listen to the people who are directly affected by specific language. They are the real experts. So for example, listen to what disabled people say about language that inclusive to people with disabilities. Respect their advice and wishes, even if it doesn't immediately make sense to you. And also remember that social groups are not monoliths. When talking about individuals, always respect how they specifically want to be called. The next tip is to try to understand. Try to understand why certain language is not inclusive and why the alternative is better. Every non-inclusive term is non-inclusive for a reason. If you understand the reasons behind it, it can make it easier to, for you to make a permanent change. It may become easier for you to remember to use the inclusive alter alternative and feel more motivated to do it. That's also why in the feedback um, in our inclusive language analysis, we include links to our help articles where you can learn more about inclusive language. And we also definitely encourage you to do your own research. And the final tip is to practice. Treat writing more inclusively like you would with any new habit that you would like to acquire. Some expressions are so deeply ingrained in our thinking after all. For example, it can feel very natural to address any group of people with you guys, if that's what you've been hearing and saying your whole life, like many of us have. Or to use words like crazy and stupid, which are so common in the English language, we don't think twice about their impact. So know that it will take time and that you will slip, but try to set out to do it a bit better every day. And give yourself space and grace for making mistakes. And with that, I want to give the floor back to Yvette, who will tell us where you can find out more about inclusive language. Thank you, Agnieszka. So we've looked at what inclusive language is, how you all benefit, what some of the misconceptions are, how to get started. And we understand that that is a lot of information and you might want to look at some more resources later, later on. So you will find from our tool several articles on our blog and in our help center. And we refer to several resources. Um, also, if you've been subscribed to, if you signed up for this webinar, uh, Jamie will send you a link, an email with a summary and some links. Um, and I imagine that she'll add the links to the show notes under the video later on. Um, it's also good to know that we have included new lessons in the All Around SEO course and in the SEO copywriting course. The only thing is that you only get access to these two courses if you have Yoast Premium. So, of course, we wouldn't be coming without bearing gifts. So, if you have signed up for this course, you will get a coupon code in the same email for your first year of Premium. And if you're looking at the recording, 
maybe you can send Jamie a sweet message, get on her email list, and who knows what happens then. But either way, whether you use the free version or the premium version, we really hope we got you excited and we really hope we're getting you willing to give us a try. And since we're still improving this tool, if you have any feedback or you have any thoughts, please shoot us an email at support at yoast.com and let us know. And our lovely support people will make sure that this gets to our team of linguists. Okay. That brings us to the end of this presentation. So let's go through some of the questions. And I'm looking at you, Jamie, because I think you have a magic way to get those to appear. Yes, I do. Um, let me just go back and see. There were some questions before. Um, Hallie asked earlier, um, should the D be capitalized? I think this is referring to the word disability. Um, that's a good question. I have seen some disabled people capitalizing it um, in reference to themselves, but more commonly I have seen it uh, yeah, with just the lowercase spelling. So if you're referring to a specific person, yeah, maybe ask that person, but in general, I would say the lowercase spelling is more commonplace. Um, Vicky asks, is the distinction if something is part of one's identity versus something temporary? In my clients' urban health programs, we say person experiencing homelessness versus homeless person. Yeah, I would say that's exactly it. Um, yeah. If it's part of your identity, you're more likely to want to use just an adjective like homeless to refer to yourself. But yeah, um, usually I would say homelessness is not a part of someone's identity. So yeah, I agree. Person experiencing homelessness is um, a better choice. But of course, as with anything, depends on the specific person. This is a two part one, so I can only show one at a time. Uh, depends on the context, but I have an issue with folks describing people as, for example, my gay neighbor or my black friend. Like, why would you need to include that information? In what situation is sharing someone's sexuality relevant? Yeah, that's a great point. So the general advice on inclusive language is to not mention such characteristics if they're not relevant, because people can often use them in sort of othering ways. Like if, let's say, yeah, you're not used to being around black people, you may, to, to you, it might be something unusual. Oh yeah, I saw this black person. Um, you might say this without thinking, but it is kind of othering black people as, yeah, being being something unusual, which, yeah, of course, it's not very inclusive. Sort of brings a thought that my parents always ask me, like, if something similar were to happen to you, how would that make you feel? And then Marianne asked, is this available on the free version of Yoast? Yes, yes, triple yes. It absolutely is. And it's something that we're really, really exciting about, excited about. Um, those are the only questions I see in the chat. Um, if anyone has any more questions, now's the time to put them in there. Last call. Oh, we got one. Sometimes I say, hey guys, in a team message, which I see is just more casual, but now I'm wondering what verbiage might be better. Yeah, I, 
I agree with your sentiment that it, it's one of those really casual phrases that we just say to appear maybe more friendly. Um, as for alternatives, um, I have heard the word folks being used uh, quite a lot instead of guys, so hey folks. Um, and yeah depending on the context there might be other more specific words i don't know hey friends if they're your friends i don't know yeah. hey, also, team. yeah teams good one yes hey peeps i've heard that one too and then there's the classic hey y'all yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. Will turning the feature on in WordPress review the entire website? Um, so you have to go to every individual post or page or yeah, type of content on your website and look at the feedback individually. Uh, but it is available for any content types. So posts, pages, uh, also taxonomies. Um, yeah, I think that's all. If there is something else I'm missing, um, it's probably also available there. <clears throat> what is the best way to grow in response when accidentally not being inclusive? Also, what is a good way to respond when you feel like someone has excluded you? Right. Um, so the first question, what's the best way to grow when you haven't been inclusive? Um, well, first of all, like I said earlier, don't feel too bad about it. Of course, apologize if you said it to a specific person and try to not do it again. But um, yeah, it just, it happens. And I think unless it's like a real bad slur or something like that, something really not acceptable. I think people usually are forgiving of these things. I think people just really value if you, if they see that you're trying and yeah. So that would be my advice. And what's a good way to respond when you feel like someone has excluded you? That's, I feel like that's a more difficult one because from my experience, I can say that some sometimes it's hard to bring these things up. You maybe don't want to, you feel like you don't want to make a big deal out of it, or you don't want to call out someone to make them feel bad, even though they did something that excluded you. Um, yeah, I think, um, one piece of advice I would give is it might be more comfortable and more conducive to something to have a conversation in private with the person. So maybe don't call them out in the big meeting or something like that. And I think in those situations, they might also be more responsive to your criticisms and maybe also try to make it clear that it's about not about the person, that they're not a bad person, but it's just about the language, which sounds obvious, but some people can really feel like they are being criticized as a person when you make these kinds of criticisms. So it's just, yeah, can be useful to highlight that. And to add to that, uh, one of the things that I learned a while ago is that it oftentimes makes more impact if you speak about someone like a few hours later or a day later. Um, first of all, it takes the emotion out of what happened to you a bit more, but also it shows that you've been thinking about it for a little longer and that usually tends to have that little bit more impact because you've thought about it, you still decided to explain it. Um, and that that does help. Or it helps several people and it's, I've tried it for me that worked too. So maybe that helps. Yeah, that's a good one.
Uh, will the info you send post webinar include how to turn on the inclusivity tool? Um, not specifically, but I think we can still make that happen, Jamie. Well, also um, with that email um, will be a link to the replay for this webinar. So you can take a look at that live demo section again um, to see how uh, Yvette turned on the tool uh, in Yoast. Um, will the recording include this chat also that we can refer to these comments later? Yeah, you should be able, um, I think so, you should be able to see the chat that was on because um, it's just on YouTube. I think, I think that is it for questions. Um, so yeah, as we said, you will be receiving uh, an email tomorrow with the webinar replay, some helpful resources and a uh, coupon code. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. And thank you uh, for being here. This was a, a really, a really great uh, presentation. And we really appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much you. for having us. Of and course. thank you all people who joined us today for taking the time and, uh, and learning about inclusive language. Thank you. Bye. Bye.